Let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise him. Praise the Lord with melodies on the lyre. Make music for him on the ten-stringed harp. Sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. For the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything he does. He loves whatever is just and good. The unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. The Lord merely spoke, and the heavens were created. He breathed the word, and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let the whole world fear the Lord, and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes. But the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen as his inheritance. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts so he understands everything they do. The best equipped army cannot save a king, nor is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory. For all its strength, it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Good morning, church. It's good to see everyone. I'm glad to be able to get away last week. Catherine and I enjoyed an anniversary weekend for the first time in a long time. It's been we celebrated our 33rd year of marriage, and so, yeah, we, uh, we just tore Miami Beach apart, and uh, yeah, not when you've been married for 33 years, right? That doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> you go to bed early. It's like, well, man, when did this happen? But anyway, hey, you know, we're in the middle of a summer series on God's wisdom. The Hebrew word for wisdom at its simplest definition is the means skill. So you might have skill as a craftsman, and that means you are a wise builder, or skill as a musician, and you are a wise musician. But from a biblical perspective, when it's applied to to life in general, it means to see the world and to see life and to interact with it from God's perspective, to live life in alignment with God's knowledge and God's understanding of how it's to be done. And when this happens, and we live according to God's wisdom, the result is that we have a good life, a holy, productive life, a life that will be moral, that will glorify God, that will bless the covenant community, and that will be blessed by God under normal circumstances. Last, or two weeks ago, Um, The takeaway truth from that message was this, that God's wisdom is both worldly and otherworldly at the same time. Now, when we say worldly, we don't mean that it's sinful and fleshly and carnal. What we mean is that God's wisdom is so pervasive that it touches every aspect of our lives. It touches anything that you face, every nook and cranny of your life. God's wisdom is there for us and for use, and it applies to whatever it is you're facing. It's, it's very practical. It has working man clothes, right? But it's also otherworldly. It has eternal impact, eternal significance. It, the destiny of your soul is affected by God's wisdom. We were in Proverbs chapter 1. We're going to return to Proverbs next week. But in those opening verses of Proverbs 1, the prologue of Proverbs, Solomon makes it very clear that in order to obtain God's wisdom, to live according to God's wisdom, to be characterized by his wisdom, that the the absolute unconditional uh, prerequisite to get God's wisdom is to walk in the fear of the Lord. And that expression 
is a hard one for us in our Western mindset to, to maybe understand. And so I gave you kind of the Jerry Clem simple sentence kind of categorization of what this means. And that the fear of the Lord is this abiding and reverent sense of God's presence in my life, in the world as a whole. It's that abiding sense of his lordship over me and my accountability to him. In, in the Bible, wisdom is not just truth and knowledge that we accumulate and understanding. It is knowledge and the truth of God that is then lived out through obedience. That's that, the accountability aspect. The fool is somebody who knows what to do and doesn't do it. The wise person knows and understands and then lives it out. This is biblical wisdom. So now we're going to do something a little different. I, we're going to take a couple of minutes. And I want you to huddle up with maybe the people you're with, your family. If you aren't with somebody, find somebody near you and maybe you can kind of talk. I'm going to give you a question about the, the fear of the Lord because the fear of the Lord is so important. And I want you to, to brainstorm this. And then we're going to have some microphones circulated and we're going to kind of see what your answers are. Here's the question. What sinful temptations, uh, what worldly philosophies or cultural obstacles fight against the fear of the Lord in our lives? What are the things that maybe you see either in your own life or in the world at, at large that are discouraging us from living with this, this sense of God's presence, this, this understanding that he is Lord over us and we're accountable to him? So I wanna give you two minutes. Start brainstorming among your family or get near with somebody and start talking, okay? All right, we've got a couple of people with microphones. If you are willing to maybe uh, share some of one or two of your answers, and if somebody t steals your answer, you got something fresh, give us add to it. Uh, raise your hand, and we'll send them to you. Uh, all right, thank you, Kyle Walters, for volunteering in the back. Uh, he was so quick to raise his hand. <laughs> That's what happens when you sit on the back row. Go ahead, Kyle. Tell us what you guys have. So I've got my, my daughter and my two sons with me today, and uh, we have come up with entertainment and success. The Ooh. Two things. They both said women, but I don't know how to put that in a better, uh. better, <laughs> better way. But, but maybe the obstacles of finding um, a godly woman, things like that. Yeah, yeah, good, very good, very good. All right, somebody else who's willing to just raise your hand and we'll, we'll send the microphone around to you. Come on. Uh, in the back, back there, good. All right, and then we have somebody right up here. If you'll get her. Hi. I have put, my put the microphone up to your mouth. Yeah, I have my son with me, Jaden, and Miss Winsome, and I, we spoke about possibly political influences. Yes, very good, very good. All right, right here. Uh, I was going to say comfort. We get very comfortable in our own sin, and so you can justify just about anything if you're comfortable. Excellent, excellent. Over here, back. And Allison, back behind the, you over there. The whole idea that God is obsolete, not really relevant to our culture. Mm, very good, very good. All right, Chris. Uh, yeah, I think one of them is the American independence philosophy. Oh, yeah, we're independent, we're our own person. Great. Down here, Allison, over here, and then... Over here, go ahead, Christy. Oh, okay. To build on that, I was saying, I was, we were talking about in our culture, relativism and pluralism and the just absence of absolute truth. Like what's true for you may not be true for me. So how can God be true for all of us? And then good things that are, that are good and can be gifts from God, but can distract us as well. And the root of all that is pride, you mm. know, wanting to do our own things and have our own control. Ooh, preach, sister. That's good. All right, Mike. Well, for me, I think it's a lot of it's reputation. I think reputation undermines, gen, you know, genuine testimony uh, for the Lord. I think it um, puts a different kind of fear in us. It puts mm. the fear of people finding out who I really am. Watch. Yeah, it. <laughs> that's great. Very good. Very good. Okay, over here. Um, Lindsay Anderson. Hi. 
Hello. All the way, she came all the way down from New Jersey just, just to answer participate. this question. Yeah. yeah. It's good to have um, you guys back. Yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say YOLO. You only live once, so do what feels good. That's a. Wow. Yeah. How much of that is rampant in our in our world and in our culture, Leslie? Um, the idea of I have the right to fill in the blank. All, you know, my rights are what come first. Mm, yeah, so I own myself. I am Lord over my own life. Excellent. All right, last one. Go ahead, Rick. Say the best for last. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, there, we came up with a lot of things. Unfortunately, we gave the microphone to the oldest guy that may have forgotten some. But... Uh, we just talked about the way the world tries to kind of pull us into what their, their beliefs are. And uh, so many times we don't really walk uprightly with God. Yeah. Yeah, the, the worldview of the world is just constantly bombarding us, encouraging us to accept that thought process. Hey, all great, great answers. Exactly, exactly right. Well, you know, in, in that first chapter of Proverbs, um, Solomon's call to fear the Lord in order to gain God's wisdom, that's paramount. But then he does something very interesting. He doesn't jump into the Proverbs. Instead, he spends the next nine chapters trying to convince us and give us the why. Why is it so important for us to you know, get God's wisdom. He doesn't go right to the God's wisdom part. He spends a large part of the book explaining why we should listen and gain God's wisdom. And we're gonna to touch on that over the next, in, uh, uh, on some of those whys in the next couple of weeks. But we gotta do something else this morning. I, I was thinking about that and I, and I said, to, if it's so important for us to understand why we should gain God's wisdom that he goes to nine chapters, isn't it also important for us to consider why should we fear the Lord? Especially since there's no gaining God's wisdom without the fear of the Lord. So why is it important for us to walk with God's wisdom? That's important, but why is it important for us to fear the Lord, which is what is the gateway to getting God's wisdom? We need to ask that question. And that's where Psalm 33 comes in. Our passage this morning, Psalm 33, helps us with the why. Why should I fear the Lord? Why should I have this sense of continual worship and awe about God, this sense of his presence in my life, his ownership and lordship of me and, and my accountability to him? And that's what Psalm 33 does. It gives us the why. But before it gives us the why, it starts by giving us the command. The command to express our fear of the Lord through joyful worship. Verse 1 says, Let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise Him. Verse 3, Sing a new song of praise to Him and sing with joy. The opening verses of this psalm are filled with these joyful overtones, which is great because it reminds us that the fear of the Lord does not mean mindless terror. When we hear this phrase, fear of the Lord, a lot of us, we go back to, you know, slash your horror, you know, I'm afraid, oh my God, he's after me, he's gonna crush me. It's this idea of an angry, vindictive, capricious God, fear of the Lord. Not at all, that's not what it means. And in these opening verses, you, you capture it because there's all these exhortations for loud singing and loud instruments. Turn up the bass, right? Well, maybe not that, but, but turn up the music. Let's sing loud, shout loud, celebrate to God. It's a wonderful picture. It may be kind of fleshing out that idea of what it means to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, which is the chief purpose and end of man, according to our catechism. Verse 3 says that we're to sing this new song in praise to God. Some of us older guys, we say, well, what's wrong with the old songs? Why do we need a new song? What's this all about? Can, can I suggest that, that there's something going on here? I was a pastor for many years uh, in another church, and we had a guy there, a deacon, and I'm going to call him Joe. 
And on our Wednesday night service, we'd have prayer and testimonies. And inevitably, maybe every other week, Joe would stand up and he would give a testimony. And after, you know, after a while, we all knew what he was going to say. He was almost verbatim. And it was always about something that God had done for him 20 years before or more. And he would get weepy and we all knew and then he would finish. And you know, One evening in a deacon's meeting, I, I gave a, a devotional and opened it up for a time of testimony. And there's Joe, he gives the same thing. And, you know, and when he was all done, there was like this awkward silence. And finally, one of the other deacons spoke up and he said, you know, Joe, you know, clearly what happened 20 years ago really was impactful, but has God done anything for you lately? You know? And that's kind of the idea here in verse 3. When it comes to expressing our fear of the Lord in worship, it is easy for us to work, for our worship to become disconnected from our everyday, daily, real life. And almost to become calcified and grounded in past events and anchored in what happened back there. And it's not, you know, pulling from current realities. And that's what's going on here in in verse 3. Verse 3 isn't so much a command for all of us to sit around at the kitchen table and try to write and compose new songs, because if that's the case, we're we're out of luck for most of us, right? Um, It's a command instead to change our frame of mind, the disposition of our heart, maybe to repent and to have the disposition of our heart and our perspective change if it's necessary to see what is God doing right now in our lives so that a fresh, new praise and understanding of who God is and what he is doing is now coming out of our lips. This new song means to see with fresh eyes God's presence in our lives, to see and hear his voice new every day, to perceive his work in our lives right now as he's transforming us into the image of Christ, to, to, to experience the, the new mercies and the fresh strength and power of God each morning. Worshiping in the, in the fear of the Lord, it is more than celebrating what God has done in our past, even though it's important for us to remember how God has been faithful to us in the past. But worshiping in the fear of the Lord, while it's not less than that, it's much more than remembering what God has done for us in the past. Worshiping in the fear of the Lord, it's, it includes us coming together corporately, singing loudly, enjoying the music, being joyful and celebrating and praising God. Worshiping in the fear of the Lord, is not, it's not less than that, but it's much more than that. It's continually worshiping God with the details of our lives. It is seeing and experiencing his daily presence. It is continually recognizing the blessings that he gives us from, from small blessings to large blessings that come our way every single day. And those blessings producing within us fresh gratitude for what he's doing right now. Not just what's happened in the past. Though it's good to remember and to honor him for that, but what about right now? The fear of the Lord means our relationship with God is so vibrant that there are things happening in our lives on such an ongoing basis that there is a regular, consistent reason for us to sing or to make melody or to testify of God's goodness and greatness in our lives. That's the new song. You know that this is happening when you're doing the dishes and you find yourself humming or whistling or those of us who like to sing, singing a song and praise to God. You're, you're worshiping in the fear of the Lord because there's these new, fresh understanding of the presence and blessings of God in your life. Where are you at this morning? Is this where you are? This is so important, right, that David in verse 8 explicitly states the command. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Here we go. Let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. That's the command. Now let's see the why. The why is all about, and this is the vast portion of the, of the psalm, the why is all focused on the person and the work of God. The why is 
God's nature and who he is and what he has done and that this is supposed to motivate this reverent awe and joyful worship of the first three verses. It's appropriate that the first picture that we get and the first way that God reveals him, especially on this day of all days, that the first way he reveals us is this good and loving heavenly father. Verse four, for the word of the Lord holds true and we can trust everything he does. He loves whatever is just and good. The unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. Everywhere we look in the world and all of creation, you can see the love of God, even for those who reject him, that he is this loving father. How cool is it that this is Father's Day and we touch on this? I'm so blessed. I have two fathers in my life, my, my biological father, my dad, he's been gone for 13 years, but I never doubted my dad's love. I miss him all the time. And, and my father-in-law, I have a phenomenal father-in-law who loves me. I mean, I know this in the core of my soul that my father-in-law loves me. I, I don't do father-in-law jokes. I have a phenomenal father-in-law. So I have had two dads, and he's alive, thankfully, and I have had two dads in my life. I can so relate to a loving father. Others of you can also, others of you can't. And that's sad. Um, but here's the great thing about the gospel. You may not have had a great relationship with your father, but through the gospel, every day can be a great Father's Day. Every day is a great Father's Day for the Christian because of the gospel. What does the scriptures tell us? How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. For those of us who love him, we get to enjoy every single day this steadfast and eternal love that is lavished on us. Don't you love that phrase? Lavished. Let's say that out loud. Just, just let it roll off your tongue. Lavished on us. One more time. Lavished on that. I, that makes me think of that guy who used to do the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Whoever that Rob, whatever his name was, right? That, the love of God just lavished on us. This is our reality of, as Christians. And so the call to fear the Lord is actually a call to ponder and see how he is daily lavishing his love on us. To daily see how he is treating us as loved sons and daughters. And to allow this to, to meditate us, to, to motivate us to worship, and to turn to reverential awe. Do you, do you take time out to ponder it? Do you see God loving you like this? Is God a loving father that is lavishing you with his love? Or is he, if it's like this, your understanding of the fear of the Lord is not shaped by the gospel and how God is revealing himself in the scriptures. The first way he motivates us is to say, see me who I am. I am your good, loving, heavenly father. See me secondly, and this is the a major portion of the psalm from verses six to 17. I am this omnipotent creator, sovereign, powerful Lord over everything. Verse six, the Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. Verse nine, when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. Verse 10, the Lord frustrates the plans of the nation and thwarts all their schemes, but the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen as his inheritance. So what's the link here? between God's omnipotence and sovereignty and our motivation to worship him in the fear of the Lord. All you have to do is take a look at the world. 
from our perspective, this world that we're living in is just, it's chaotic and it is a mess. It is growing more dangerous and harder to understand, it seems like, every month that goes by. The, the tragedies and the atrocities mount up. You look at the nations of the world and in, in our lifetime, many of us have probably never felt less safe and secure than we feel right now. And you see nations rattling swords and all of these things going on. And so how do you rest? How are you secure when markets are crashing and nations are at war and other nations are ascending and threatening and inflation is, I mean, just, I mean it's just nuts. And then you got people who just for no reason at all pull out guns and go crazy. It's becoming like, the vogue thing to do. This is nuts. And yet in the middle of all of this, God says, I got this. I got this. Children, I am your loving Father who is absolutely omnipotent and in control of everything. And these nations, you know what they're like? This is how he says it through Isaiah. They're like the dust that accumulates on your dresser top. You know how your dust gets up on your, your dresser? You come along and you just go, blow it away. Yep, right time. That's exactly what I'm going to do to these guys. Been doing it all through history. I've raised them up. They perform exactly what I need them to do for my purposes. Gone. That's our God. You look at Russia, you look at China, you look at all of these other nations and all of their missiles and all of their tanks and all of this, and they're just dust. In fact, God says, you know what they are? They're grasshoppers. Grasshoppers. I had one in my garden the other day. You know what I did to it? Squished. Then I went in and I touched Catherine without washing my hands. No, I'm joking. I didn't do that to you, baby. I've been married 33 years. I've learned. Don't do that, guys, boys. That's not how you get girls. Just saying. Okay? Free tip right there. And the great thing about our God's sovereignty and his control over everything, it's not a despotic, tyrannical, capricious kind of rule It's formed and it's shaped by his holiness and his perfection, his perfect love, his perfect power, his perfect knowledge, his perfection in everything, including his plan, which is perfect, even though from our perspective at times it looks very imperfect. And that's why the call is to trust him, trust in the character of God, trust in the goodness of God of our loving heavenly father. Third way he's revealed, I love this verse 18, as the eternally vigilant savior. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death. We we had an advertisement up here earlier. Uh, The ladies of our church are park hopping on, what is it, Tuesdays? Thursdays, Thursdays, you're park hopping. They're going around into different parks and they're gathering and those who have children are bringing their children, those who don't come. You know what I've observed with ladies, uh, moms who have children, little children at parks or at the house or whatever. Moms, you are amazing because you can be around the picnic bench and you can be eating and drinking and laughing with your friends and here they are, they can be in mid-sentence laughing and talking, and all of a sudden, like flash from the DC universe, they're just gone. And they, they're talking one second, then they're gone. They have caught their to- toddler who was about to fall from the ladder, and then they're back, and they just pick right back up, right where they were at. Only moms can do this. This is why when couples come to me and say, hey, what do you think about, you know, Maybe dad being Mr. Mom and mom working instead and, and dad raising the kids. I said, Listen, there's nothing unbiblical about it. Just expect trips to the hospital that wouldn't normally happen, <laughs> right? 
Because moms have this eye, this, this quick eye of love. They can multitask. They can talk and do all these different things. And at the same time, somehow they have this magical ability to know exactly what's going on with that child. I don't know how you do it, ladies. I can't do it. But here's the interesting thing. The Lord watches over those. That, that phrase, watches over, that, that's literally quick eye of love. God has the mom's eye over all of us. He has that quick eye of love. In other words, he, he, is, he is doing everything in the universe, and at the same time, you have his absolute undivided attention so that in a moment of danger or whatever it is that's going on in your life, the trial, the tribulation, the need, boom, he's there. Right in the nick of time, the New Testament tells us, he gives us his presence and his grace to address that situation. That quick eye of love, it's right there. He defends us and he secures us physically and spiritually. And ultimately, we see this in Jesus. Jesus uses different imagery. He uses the imagery of the shepherd and the, the sheep. And he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Talk about security. An eternal savior. This is our Lord why should we joyfully worship him and walk in the fear of the Lord? Because he is this loving, good father in control of everything who has promised to save us and secure us all the way to the end. This is the why. The command, express our fear of the Lord through joyful worship. The why, the motivation for our fear of the Lord is who he is and what he has done and he's doing for us. Now, we come to the application and it's our takeaway truth this morning. Since God is all good, all loving, all powerful, it is foolish to not put our faith and hope in him. Verses 20 to 22, the last three verses of the Bible is a prayer of response from God's people to God. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Not a political party, not the war horses, not the government, not the armies, not the smart man, the wise man, not our 401ks, not our bank accounts, not our careers, not our spouses, not our children, not our nation. Nothing of this human realm is our shield. It is God and God alone. He is our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice for we trust in his holy name. And literally, we trust in his character. We trust in who God is. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. We trust in who he is. This is, God's, this is what God is saying. Trust in who I am. Not who you think I am. Not who you want me to be. Trust in who I have revealed myself to be in my word. Trust in who I am. And the great thing is, is when we trust in our Lord, we then receive this perfect hope, a secure hope that's good for all of our future. And that hope is anchored in Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews was writing to a group of Jewish people who had kind of experimented with Jesus. They had, you know, come into the a, a, a congregation, maybe it's somewhat like ours, and they had heard the gospel. They understood Jesus' claim to be the Messiah, that he was God in the flesh, that he had come and died for their sins, and they had made steps towards Jesus, but now they were reconsidering. They were thinking more like, maybe it is the law. Maybe it is my obedience to the law. It's my self-goodness and work and righteousness that I should be resting in. And so they were tempted to turn back, to go back, and rely upon themselves and to religion. And to these people, the author of Hebrews wrote this. God bound himself with an oath 
so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we have fled to him for refuge, to him for refuge. We who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. How beautiful this is and a fulfillment of what the psalmist is talking about here in Psalms 33. Our Lord, our hope is Jesus. That one who is the yes and the amen to all of God's promises. That one who came and died for us, who is the very embodiment of this love that has been lavished upon us so that we can be reconciled to God. That one who has given to us the Holy Spirit so that we can walk in peace and enjoy even in the midst of chaos that happens in our world. That one who now lives inside us through his spirit who promises to transform us into his image. He is our hope. He's the hope for all who will trust in him. And so the first question is, have you trusted in him? Because the fool is the one who puts his hope in something or someone other than Jesus. That's the fundamental message of the Bible. God's wisdom starts by receiving the very gift of God, Jesus, who is the embodiment of all of God's wisdom. It starts right there. Are you trusting in God? Are you trusting in Jesus for your relationship with God and for your eternal hope? May that be true for everyone here. And if it's not true for you, I hope that you'll see me after the service or you'll come to our care area back in the corner where we will have counselors and pastors who are more than happy to, to help you in your spiritual journey to meet Jesus. And for those of us who already know him, may this week we perceive in a fresh way, a new way, his presence in our life, the lavish love of God being poured out upon us through him. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for that love that we have through Jesus. For the one who doesn't know you, Jesus, I would pray that even now you begin to work in their life. They would feel that conviction, that tug in their heart that something is wrong, that they need to, do, that they need to respond to this offer. And Father, for those of us who know you, because Christ is living in us, would you focus our attention on the one who deserves it, the one who's gone before us, who died on the cross for us, who has walked through that veil, who now sits at the right, your right hand and intercedes before us as our high priest. God, give us the grace we need to, to keep our eyes focused on him, that we may find our satisfaction in Jesus alone this week, that his presence in us will be very real, that when he convicts, when he reproves, we'll respond with humility. When he guides and, and encourages May it produce fruit that is good for the kingdom. And most of all, Lord, may we end up glorifying you through his presence in our lives this week. In your name we pray these things, Jesus. Amen.